morning. We're at the Tonto National Monument right now, and we're going to do a couple of short hikes and check out some cliff dwellings. So at Tonto National Monument, there's an upper and a lower cliff dwelling, and the upper cliff dwelling, you have to have a guided park ranger, and you have to make reservations, and that was booked for this weekend. So we're going to do the lower cliff dwelling, which Rudel is allowed on, and our America the Beautiful Pass gets us in. We are right outside, what, Roosevelt, Arizona? Roosevelt, Arizona. Yeah. We just camped uh, not even two miles from here on some National Forest Service land. That was just absolutely beautiful. A very private, uh, quiet road. Nobody seems to be around this area this time of year. Yeah, it was beautiful yesterday. Some high clouds and some rain. And it's beautiful today, but I, I don't want to sound like I'm complaining, but it's a wee bit hot today. Yeah, we're not used to this heat yet. <laughs> not for what, the 2nd of March. Yeah. The van only said it was 64 degrees, but it feels like it's 90. Yeah, it, we're just not ready for it yet. <laughs> So we're going to check this out before we head further south in Arizona. The smaller blooms, the Vigas, are Arizona sycamore that came out of our riparian area. And then the little pieces that go across are saguaro cactus ribs. On top of that is four to six inches of adobe, and then you're ready for your second story or a rooftop that they would have used. Okay. In this case, there was a second story up there. Okay. So every room would have had a small hearth, a fire that they would um, cook in. So there are was a lot of smoke in each of the rooms, mm -hmm. so they would have used community areas and gotten outside as much as possible. How many rooms are in this one? So there's 20 rooms in this dwelling, or wow. were at that time. About 60 people, they believe, lived here. There are a few community areas that I can show you when we go around to the other side. Okay. But um, this was built by the Salado people, and the Salado is not a tribe in, in itself, in essence. It's a phenomena that happened. So this, in this area, we had multiple migrations come into the what we call the Tano Basin, which was a river, not a lake. Okay, down here? Down there. So, so. there was a river. The Salt River ran through. And then um, in the basin, about 3,000 people lived. Up here, about 250 in all multiple areas. Okay. So the Salado people were probably a group of the Hohokam were here first, had built canals and farming. The ancestral Puebloan, and this is ancestral Puebloan style, came down from the north or Four Corners area. From the western area in the northwest came the Mugion people. So we had multiple tribes coming into this area 
that over a period of time developed their own culture. Okay. So they they made a different pottery than the other people were known for, called polychrome tricolored pottery, that they became well known for. They did amazing weavings, and their burial practices changed just a little bit. So therefore, they are um, archaeologists gave them their own name. The people that live by Rio Salado, the Salado being the Salt River. Hmm. So this would have been an individual room. About four people would probably have slept and shared in this home. In this little square in this space little here. Square. So, and then these were two stories. Okay, so there's three rooms here. There's three rooms here. There's two over there, and these would have been two stories. Okay. And then this room right here, uh, perhaps it, we know it was a community, probably a community gathering area. It's a little bit it, bigger. It's bigger. It never had. Um, walls you know smooth walls on the cliff side these walls were smooth but the cliff side was no and it never had a ceiling so we believe that this was used as a community room in conjunction with the two rooftops of these two rooms these were single story across the back and we believe they had you know rooftops on them that they used in conjunction with this which would also have helped with their ventilation oh okay so um, amazing yeah if you look close, the adobe is put on by hand, usually by the women and children. So you can find um, hand prints, fingerprints oh. on the walls that are kind of cool. That's cool. And then obviously these steps were added by the Park Service in the 1950s. This is a mano and a matate that the women would have used to grind corn and mesquite beans, and they spent about four hours a day grinding corn and mesquite beans. Wow. So the um, work that you see with the wood and the metal was done by the National Park Service in the 1930s. So that was just to kind of preserve just it. Just to keep these walls from falling, and that's the best technology we had at that time. So it might be a little different today, but that's what we knew in the 1930s. Looks this, like it's worked dwelling was severely vandalized in the 1880s and early 1900s, which is why we just let people come in here. So, there is a small hearth in that room in the floor. That's what all rooms would have had. It's, and the whole floor was smooth like that hearth. So the hearth is like a uh, fire? A small fire pit. Okay. They would cook on and use as fire. Wow. The other room that you can go up here has a completed ceiling, which is very nice to see. So if you can get your camera to catch it, this room has a complete ceiling in it. And up in the left corner is a crawl access to the roof above. If oh, back there where the light is? No, it's way up here. Oh, I see. So that's right how they would have gotten up to the next level. There's also some more mantles and matates in here, um, pieces of wood that have fallen that are original to this room. Yeah. The people, we feel like they were a thriving culture because they had time to do a lot of artwork. They did um, amazing pottery and amazing textile weaving. So it tells us that if they had time for things like that in community, that they weren't just trying to survive. Survive, yeah. Yeah.